go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the very first live episode of KBE Insider. It's a very new show. I will uh, hand it off to my very illustrious friend, Langdon White, to tell you a little bit more about it. Uh, but I'm very excited to have the show coming on the channel, and the folks that are helping us with it are awesome. So, yes, thank you very much. Langdon, tell us a little bit more about the show. Definitely. Uh, so I'm Langdon White, uh, as you uh, may know me from another show called The Love Health Hour, um, you know, and uh, other places on the channel. Uh, you should definitely uh, come check out other things that we do here. Um, but this show is specifically about uh, kind of in, in combination with a site we kind of relaunched uh, during Summit, I guess, two weeks ago now, um, and uh, called Kubernetes by Example. And Kubernetes Kubernetes by example.com. Uh, the idea of the site is to kind of uh, be really focused on the kind of how to and the walkthroughs at the uh, really basic levels of Kubernetes. So that, you know, if you don't really understand what a pod is, there's kind of a whole special area about what is a pod, uh, kind of explaining not only uh, how to kind of use one in kind of a brass tax sort of way, but also like kind of the reason for it as well. So you can kind of try to get a deeper understanding of what Kubernetes is and how it functions. Um, and it kind of takes a multi, what we were trying to do with the site is like take a multi, uh, multi learner approach. Uh, and so, so there's like video content, there's also like actual like training class style content, there's written content, uh, so that, you know, depending on what kind of learner you are, you can kind of approach it, uh, you know, in the best way that works for you. So that was kind of one aspect of it. But as part of that, we also wanted to do some live content, uh, you know, because we know a lot of people, as we've seen with the OpenShift TV channel, right, have really started to engage with the kind of Twitch or streaming style of, of content understanding. So this show is kind of a, a nod to that. We're trying to, to deliver that type of content as well. But specifically what we're doing with this show is to try to give you some of the philosophy, in a sense, behind Kubernetes um, or the ethos or whatever word you like to use. But it really helps when you're trying to learn something new uh, to understand what its goals are or why it's trying to do that, uh, you know, because then things become more intuitive when you are looking at the actual content because it all starts to fit together because you're you understand the larger block it's trying to build. So we're trying to give some of that color by giving you access or interviews with the uh, people who actually make Kubernetes kind of go. Uh, and uh, so uh, but as part of that, we also need to give you the context in which, uh, you know, all that's happening. And so um, Mina, who is going to be a regular on the show, is uh, going to tell us and also actually updates the content on the website for the news, um, is going to tell us kind of in the last month, because the show appears every month, uh, what's been happening lately uh, in Kubernetes land. And, you know, and you can kind of keep going back to the, the site to learn that information as well. Um, and this will get a lot tighter uh, as I repeat it more often. Uh, but <laughs> without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce Mina. Um, and if you want to tell us a little bit about what's happening in Kubernetes. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. I'm Mina. Uh, if you saw episode zero of, of our show, you uh, may already be familiar with my face, but um, I'm here to kind of tell you a little bit about what we uh, uploaded onto the KBE website uh, since we launched a couple weeks ago. So as you may know, uh, Cube uh, turned seven this month. Uh, so with that, we wanted the first week, um, so a couple of weeks ago, to be the introduction to Kubernetes. So we definitely wanted to talk about some, some news, some latest news, but we also wanted to talk about the five tips we wish we knew sooner about Kubernetes. Um, and we learned that those are successful automation requires diligent auditing, uh, ignore Kubernetes pod labeling at your budget's peril, understand your application's resource needs, don't play around with ETCD, and you don't need to go it alone. Um, so those were the five tips that we wanted to bring to you um, so that you know them before you know um, you actually had to. Um, there was Siloscape, which was the first malware to target Windows containers that broke out of uh, cube clusters to plant backdoors and raid nodes for credentials, which was pretty important. It was everywhere. Uh, people were kind of freaking out about it. Um, 
And then we wanted to bring a case study for you. Uh, so Flipkart is India's leading e-commerce company, and they actually recently adopted Open EBS for uh, storage on Kubernetes. Um, and some of the key lessons the Cube platform team at Flipkart has learned from this migration was that being production ready is really important, um, uh, obviously. Uh, managing storage resources, uh, creating a volume uh, group construct, uh, LVM partition, and disk failure response. So those were the five things that they kind of focused on the most as they were migrating. Um, yeah, as they were migrating. And then second week, we kind of wanted to bring you more opinion pieces from thought leaders in the space. Um, and the most notable of these were uh, Matt Assay said that we're thinking about Kubernetes all wrong. Um, he told us that um, we have to try, we should try using Kubernetes like an app server for smaller teams um, instead of treating it like a centralized cloud. Um, and then we had David Lenthicum who said, it's time to get more aggressive with Kubernetes. As Kubernetes is really mature now, I just mentioned it turned seven, um, he's saying it's time to take some risks and develop the next generation of applications. He even said that perhaps we can weaponize it to build, uh, build a better business. And then we also gave you the top 25 Kubernetes experts to follow on Twitter. Um, whether you're just learning Kubernetes or you're already a seasoned container buff, uh, you'll need the right, right resources available, um, such as tutorials and monitoring tools, which is kind of what we're trying to give you with the KBE website anyways. Um, and this also includes following the right people on Twitter as well who can open your eyes to what you can do with Kubernetes. Um, so that was a quick highlight of what we talked about since we launched um, on the KBE news section. I'm gonna drop some links in the chat as well in case you guys wanna go to the articles and, and see what they're talking about. Uh, but you can always come on the KBE news section of the KBE website to, to see what's going on in the world of Kubernetes and keep yourself up to date on what's happening. Um, and with that, I'm giving it back to Chris Short. Uh, take it away. Yes, I think it's vitally important that if you're mucking with etcd, that you do not muck with etcd, <laughs> unless it's just to give it the performance uh, profile that it needs. Uh, so thank you, Mina. Awesome work. Uh, Gordon Tilmore dropped the link in chat to the overarching news page. Um, so yeah, feel free to drop any of those links in, Mina. Uh, so Langdon, we have a special guest with us, right? Like we do. We should we probably do. introduce this special guest of ours. Right. Uh, although, I mean, how much introduction does he really need? Um, Fair so uh, this is uh, Clayton Coleman, uh, maybe architect of Kubernetes for Red Hat. I, I don't know what your actual title is. Yeah. As we often Who talk about Daddy? on the other show, we, we have uh, like Red Hat's really good about changing uh, group names and titles and all that stuff on a really regular basis. Uh, so we always like to say, Clayton, could you introduce what your title is yourself? Because you like we know. So today, right. my title is probably something like um, architect for hybrid cloud applications in a changing and complex world where Kubernetes is super important and helps you get a lot of stuff done, but can be even better. That's my title today. Right. Okay. Um, but you have to work even red better. That's there, so what I'm going with. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, nice. Uh, cool. So, so what is it that you kind of do most of the time with uh, Kubernetes or, you know, kind of in your job role? Sure. And, and I've been, you know, um, you know, for the last seven years since just before Kubernetes was publicly announced, like I've been a part of the project and I've kind of shifted my role, um, you know, so I still contribute heavily. Well, I'd like to say I contribute heavily. It's uh, maybe a trickle compared to what uh, what I was lucky enough to be able to do for the first three, four years. Um, uh, I participate in SIG architecture and um, a number of SIGs, kind of trying to help, um, you know, uh, smooth over the gaps. Um, you know, we've got a pretty effective community system these days um, where, you know, SIG contribux and the community that's built up around Kubernetes, you know, all the people who participate from big companies to individuals using it in their home labs, um, we've kind of got a pretty good system. And so I kind of function almost as a kind of a background cog, um, just making sure that stuff ticks over. Um, I spend a lot of time focused on um, kind of the thorny or gnarly issues um, and try to help, um, you know, teams that work within Red Hat or teams, um, you know, across companies or individuals uh, try to catch trends early. Um, so, you know, things that are important in Kubernetes, the project, and Kubernetes has a really, you know, uh, uh, firm uh, boundary and there's mm -hmm. a whole bunch of stuff out there. I kind of try to 
help people move across that interface. So is it something that Kubernetes needs to improve? Okay, let's sort out and work with some teams and um, people and you know, bring together the folks who care about an issue. And sometimes it's um, you know, around or above Kubernetes. Um, and I spent a lot of time um, with OpenShift um, and the OpenShift community and people using um, you know, Kubernetes in production. And I spent a lot of time listening to what they say and then saying, well, you sure know, it's that's all very a, positive. Yeah, yeah it, it's, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, if you make it something that's this important to you, um, when it breaks, uh, when something goes wrong, when you start hitting limits, when you hit the kind of what is Kubernetes great for and what is Kubernetes not great for, when you start hitting those limits, um, trying to help, you know, think about where Kubernetes can go or where the ecosystem around Kubernetes can go or how Kubernetes itself should change. So it's kind of a, it's a mishmash of um, big, I write a lot of PowerPoint presentations um, and I do most of my coding in PowerPoint these days, but um, but it's, it's a lot of communication and, you know, helping people, helping people come together and find like, uh, you know, that lucky person who also cares about the same problem as you. Um, th that's actually what I really enjoy is when I can connect two people who have the same problem and then they can go fix it in Kubernetes. We can get it. We can make the world a little bit better a place every day. Right, right. Um, yeah, I, I would actually like to explore the uh, communication part of the problem uh, a bunch more. But before we do that, I would like to ask you, and we're, we're trying to set up a, some, a theme here of when we do the show, you know, can you tell us a little bit about uh, like how you got into open source to begin with? Like what brought you into the, that community or into that uh, world? Well, so it was really interesting. I went to work for this company called Red Hat. Uh -huh. And uh, I certainly have used... Them. I had used open source prior to that. Um, I actually worked at IBM, ironically enough. Um, you know, started out of college, worked at IBM um, in North Carolina for like 10 years. And I was like, you know, I did a lot there. And I, you know, I knew open source and I kind of was familiar with it. Um, a bunch of friends uh, worked at uh, Red Hat and they're like, we're working on this really cool thing. It's going to change the world. It's called containers. And I was like, man, it doesn't sound that interesting. Um, <laughs> well, okay, fine, whatever. Uh, yeah. And so I, you know, in the early days, I used open source and, you know, Red Hat is very intense about open source. And so it's kind of like, oh, okay, this is interesting. And um, it's actually been awesome because I'm mean, working at Red Hat, like uh, there's a little bit of the, the mindset is, is you're doing it for three sets of people, communities, uh, customers, and partners. Mm -hmm. And your job is to balance those and make sure everybody's working together because it's not just, you know, we're not just doing it and you don't go out and just make something and then hope people use it. And you don't go focus only on the customer and don't think about how community can benefit the customer. And then like partners, um, you know, that could be anybody, but it's other people trying to make stuff that matters that they can, you know, keep going for a long time. And so, you know, communities are diverse things, but there's kind of a customers and partners help kind of anchor that community. And so, for me, that was actually really helpful because, you know, I, I got a lot of stuff to do. I love programming, but I like having a purpose. And that was a really great purpose to have. So I, I enjoy that. Um, you know, it's that constant, you know, feedback loop between something that's awesome that someone has shared. And, and a lot of these days, a lot of it is, you know, large companies or people, uh, an engineering team at a large company who say like, we made this, we want it to be useful. And there's a, there's a lot of question marks after, well, you know, here's this open source stuff. Like what happens if that company goes away? What happens if those people don't want to work on it anymore? Um, so trying to figure out that loop is, um, has been, you know, what I've learned over the last nine years is like, there's a lot of ways to do it. And it's super important for everybody. Although what I'm also hearing there, right, is that, um, you know, what you, you see a lot of value in communication again, right? Is that is those, you know, you kind of have those three groups, right? And making, and not making them work together, but, you know, making them work together, uh, you know, is, is a lot about uh, communication between those groups. Um, so and then kind of more specifically, you know, when we're talking about Kubernetes, what, what, okay, so you got pulled into the container world pretty quickly when you got connected to Red Hat. Um, what brought you, because was well, nine years, so like that's a, a little bit, you were doing a little bit of stuff before Kubernetes launched. Um, what brought you, what made you think, huh, Kubernetes, this thing, this container thing's got some legs. Maybe this Kubernetes thing does too. 
But, you know, it's funny. Um, so this is like, you know, even my memory is starting to get hazy about that period in the early days of Kubernetes. But I, this is one of my favorite stories because it was like, it was such a, you know, we, uh, Docker came out and I think it was 2013. Yeah. yeah. Everybody was yeah, like, yeah. you know, containers existed before that OpenShift used them. Um, you know, there were different parts of it, C groups and process containment and Linux and lots and lots of stuff. You know, Docker kind of crystallized. It had that like three, you know, pieces you could, Download something, which then you know, we all download stuff off the internet and run it as root on our systems. That's like what we do. Um, and it, you could get a reproducible environment. And then it it mostly just worked. Um, and that combination, like that year, I remember like this, this sense of like excitement and, you know, everybody was, you know, this could be the next, you know, big thing. Cause it was, it was something that worked well, put together in a novel way, um, a little bit like maybe like the first iPhone, right? You know, it was the the world before Docker and the world after Docker are very different. And so, mm -hmm. you know, through that year, um, you know, we were on OpenShift, we've been doing containers for a while and we we're like, we need to get, you know, there's, we want to modernize um, because we kind of had done that, you know, here's the first phase. Um, and then we started talking to a number of people um, in the background. We talked to a few people at Google. Um, I think Brendan and Tim, uh, Brendan Burns and Tim Hawken uh, did a demo for us of their, uh, at the time it was called the sevenlet, which is the, what the, the prototype cubelet that they built internally at Google. Um, and they showed some UI and we're like, oh, that's interesting. You know, we're working on some stuff too, you know, tell us like, tell us if you're going to launch this. And um, we got a call like one week in, I think it was the end of May or the beginning of June, um, just before uh, DockerCon. And they're like, hey, we're actually going to go through with this. Are you guys in? And we were like, uh, sure, sounds awesome. And we had kind of been, you know, it was kind of one of those like fortuitous accidents for us, which is it was the right place and right time for us to be like, we think this is an awesome idea. We're willing to do it in the open. We're willing to work. We're willing to, I don't want to say throw away, but we're willing to throw away everything that we did before because it used containers. And even Kubernetes, like it wasn't really about Docker containers. It was about generic containers right and it was about containers at scale and like a lot of you know docker works great on your local laptop and then that scaling up factor everybody was building their own container orchestration systems but this one felt like it had like you know the google folks i really respect them um you know in those early days like there's a there was a bunch of domain knowledge that they shared and mm -hmm. then they were willing to listen and a bunch of other people in the community were like we know some um we've got a lot of like experience. So it, uh, on OpenShift, we had a bunch of experience in like dev loops on top of containers versus dev loops on top of VMs or what happens when you want to do something that's more complex than a 12 factor app? Like how do you do a development or a software update loop for a database? So even from those early days, like we were thinking about, you know, we, were, we had a lot of compatible worldviews. So we launched, they launched at uh, KubeCon, I got, or at DockerCon that uh, year in 2014 or I'm getting my years wrong, but yeah, it, this is yeah. how long it's been at this point. Uh, and <laughs> we, uh, I was, I think I was one of the first contributors. I got like the commit bit on um, the repo and it mm -hmm. went public and we all showed up in Slack or it wasn't even Slack at that time. I think it was pre Slack. We were using a bunch of, uh, I think we decided to use Slack very early, but it, we, we showed up, we showed up in chat and we started opening GitHub issues and, you know, it kind of snowballed. I mean, there was nothing uh, really in the repo. It was, a, it was a basic idea and was, you know, it wrote some stuff into etcd and then the kubelet had this really janky loop. Um, and now we have, you know, it wrote back forth and we added an API layer and we designed some APIs. We came up, you know, some of the ideas that we had around like declarative config and being able to kube control apply, like those were the seeds of them were there, but it took, you know, years to see them realize that was, that was a really awesome period for me in my life. Um, I'm very grateful to have had the chance to kind of be at ground zero of that. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, you know, and I, I'm not sure if I'll get the number right, but I mean, I think it probably, it also helped, right. That, you know, both Red Hat uh, like, and particularly Google, right. Google had, this was like their third try or something of like orchestrating at scale for their own internal stuff, right. It was kind of a lot of what was, maybe it was even the fourth try, right. Like, you know, and, and one of the things that I think people particularly who are new to software or are outside the software world don't realize is, you know, 
we it's actually really good for us to rewrite things um often from from scratch um because then we make we recognize some of the choices that we made early on that may not have been the best choice um you know and then you know because you know the thing evolves or whatever it's been so nice in the past i don't know 10 or 15 years right that it, even less than that that our software has actually gotten so um kind of rebuild quickly um you know so like languages like python and stuff you know make it so you can redo things much more efficiently than you ever used to in the big waterfall, uh, you know, development models of the early 2000s. Well, and I mean, you know, there's, it was interesting too, because um, I think, uh, you know, a lot of the Googlers brought things that didn't work or experiments and investigations and, um, you know, in a bit of a change for Google, they were very willing to, um, to kind of share. I always joked with Brian Grant, who was one of the, um, the Google architects um, and kind of helped, you know, even, even today, Brian kind of his Twitter uh, is on the uh, list of the top 25 and Brian always has these great, you know, insightful, um, you know, connections. And he was, we j used to joke that sometimes on um, GitHub issues that he'd, he'd drop a paragraph of summary about, you know, how, how they thought about a particular problem. And I would laugh and I'd be like, that's like $10 million of R and D research. And, and, you know, engineering time and pain and effort that's been nicely summarized into a single paragraph so that we can avoid it. So there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of knowledge sharing. And to be honest, um, you know, the way that we envisioned cube in the early days, I don't think is the cube that we have now. Right. Um, there's certainly a lot of areas where the, uh, whatever we, there were even early on, you know, there was uh, probably most cube clusters, the average size of a cube cluster is one to two nodes probably. Um, just because lots and lots of people run really small clusters for testing or trying things out or on their home machine or they run Minikube and now they run Kind or in the early days they ran OC cluster up or, you know, uh, there's like a million solutions for running these small clusters and your problems are different when you're just doing local dev. Um, and I think that's something that Kubernetes, um, even though it's designed to be, you know, 10 to a thousand nodes, um, this kinds of things that people look for in their local iterative dev, dev loop aren't always the same. And we can still improve that. There's still things that we can go do. So there's a, there's a rich vein of um, you know, things that we didn't achieve that if we come back and look at them a second time, maybe there's actually some really new um, ideas still lurking there because mm -hmm. we've got a mature Kubernetes and we can depend on it, but we can take it in new directions. Well, and that's, I think what we want to talk about a little bit more is actually specifically what, you know, what did you have in mind there? Like what, what are some of the examples of, you know, the places where you see the biggest change happening or the biggest, um, you know, the biggest opportunities in a sense um, going, you know, in kind of the next steps. So, um, and this is, uh, I'll, I'll say this sounds bad just off the surface. Kubernetes has calcified a bit. Um, which is when you have a big mature project with lots of people, you know, kind of helping in little areas. Um, it's not like when you have a small team, right? Like I think everybody in the world knows, like when you have a small team, you do a bunch in one direction and you kind of sketch out a, an arc and then you had to fill in the details and you filled those details over time. So you, you had fixes or you go figure out that the stuff you hacked together in a weekend. Um, was awesome. Bad. Like, I, I, you know, I, I have a, PR open right now to Kubernetes, which is a really subtle issue in the kubelet. And all of the code that I'm changing has, you know, is five years old or more. Um, mm -hmm. And it's stuff that it mostly works. But just as, you know, as, as contributors come and go, um, you know, as we get busy, so like folks on Signode, like, there's a lot of, um, you know, we got kind of got a second or third generation of Signode contributors going through now. There's a lot of, I don't want to say domain knowledge that's lost, but you got to bring it back into context and everybody's busy. So there's a lot of, uh, of uh, layers of cube. One of the things that I think going forward is there's maybe two dimensions I think are like super interesting to try. So one of them is like the really small, um, you know, clusters. Like what do you actually want when you're doing local iterative development or when you want to test something locally or when you want to test just the basics of an idea um, around something that's declarative, right? So like on our laptops, we have Git repos and we run commands all day long. But when we start checking things into source control, we're trying to, we're trying to describe the idea and then have it, you know, survive for a long time. And so GitOps and like the idea that, you know, your source code or your configuration or documentation, like you put them in source control 
and you can see their history and you can mm -hmm. capture your idea. And even though, you know, the code and configuration are kind of different, they're really not. Um, sometimes they have external dependencies like libraries and sometimes they depend on external systems or APIs that might change. But, you know, you've seen like those infrastructure as code um, ideas where you have, you write some code and it goes and changes the system. There's a lot of similarities. When you do that local development, like most people sitting down, like they just got to learn a concept and they hope it doesn't change. So like in languages, you get like a, an API contract from your, your language, like Go. And the, the, the Go team tries not to break you. And um, your dependencies, um, sometimes you use stuff from people who don't really care about, you know, long-term thinking, right? Open source has a lot of this, you write a library, someone gets bored, move on, um, they get That's burned bad. out and yeah. they leave it. Uh, and what do you do as someone who consumes that dependency, that API? Conversely, like Cube is designed to be kind of flexible. And the most successful thing about Kubernetes um, beyond just basic deployment is that extensibility where people were like, hey, like I can add an API. That API represents, you know, some idea that Cube doesn't have, I can add to it. Trying to figure out like a way, and this is kind of like the big idea that um, I talked about at KubeCon was APIs are really important, um, but you don't always need like a full Cube cluster. So what if we mm -hmm. can kind of tease apart the config and the defining the world, like an API for code. Um, we have them all the time, like Docker files are an API right. or a Travis YAML file that you stick in your Git repo that tells the CI system, that's an API. Those are just represented as config in your code and they define a process or whatever. So having something really small that kind of lets you deal with a loop um, that you could take source code and config and put it into a Git repo and then have it show up on a local thing that you could then deploy to other systems. It works fine today. Most people are kind of uh, using it cube as cube. I think one of the things, and this connects to the second idea is um, when you think about having lots of cube clusters, um, you've got a definition of your application and you put it in source control and then you put it on one of those clusters. Sometimes you're doing GitOps or sometimes you're using a tool like Argo or sometimes it's something you've built yourself. In fact, a lot of, at a lot of big companies, almost every large organization running Kubernetes has some system on top of Kubernetes that tells Kubernetes what to do. Sometimes that's oh, you know, a light touch, like it just makes some changes, um, deploys your code. Sometimes that's a whole platform that's been built on top that might be older than Kubernetes. It's been evolved or adapted or you're in the process of tearing it down. So we think of tend to think of Kubernetes like when we talk about it, it's like, it's this thing, it provides value. But what's really important is all the stuff around it that people use, whether it's the development side story or whether it's the control story above. Um, that's what I'm really interested in is how can we take some of the cube ideas, um, but tease them apart and use them for that area above or the area below. And KCP, which is a prototype that we you know demoed and it's very specifically a prototype, not a project yet, because it's a mm -hmm. idea of something in the future um, is this, I wanna call it, it's, it's almost what anybody can interpret. It's a prototype that shows the idea of, you don't need a cube cluster to have a cube API. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't need a cluster to have a cube API, you can use it to do multi-cluster. So you can talk to the control plane or talk to a KCP and then it talks to the clusters for you. And there's people out there doing this, like um, this isn't like a novel idea by any means, but it feels like cube. And then on local development, if you could just run one of these locally, we could tie it into other systems, not just Kubernetes, but maybe Docker Compose or tying it into system D or, and if you hate system D, you can tie it into bash. Um, <laughs> the idea that kind of the, the stuff that you, you create a deployment in a service, what does a deployment in a service mean? It's, it can be a little flexible. So we're kind of exploring in this idea right now, um, but it's a lot of big ideas and it's really early. So it doesn't really, we're kind of trying to get to that point where we can show a prototype that feels awesome, as awesome mm -hmm. as Docker did. Um, I don't, I, I will be very humble and say, I don't think it's going to feel as awesome as Docker did that first time that I used it. Um, but we're looking for that, you know, what's the, what's some stuff that kind of shakes off the, the boringness and the, uh, the, the resiliency of cube and says, here's some new ideas. Where can we go with them? So, so specifically around that. So, um, 
it's funny, like system D, I actually think is a great example because I think system D in kind of concept is a really good one. One of the things I don't like about system D is that it's an interface with an embedded implementation all the time. And what I really wish system D was, was an interface and then had pluggable implementations. Um, so what I, I'm kind of curious about is, is with what you're describing, you know, where are there similarities to kind of that system D idea or even the Linux kernel, right? In the sense that you're, you're looking at starting to offer kind of an API with almost pluggable implementations or, and then also you're at least some of the stuff I've heard you talk about before is a uh, kind of pluggable API as well, right? Is that you don't necessarily have, you know, I don't know, there's, there's 32 APIs, right? But you only have three of them in this particular instance um, because you only need three out of the 32 for this particular project. And, you know, like uh, I think you could use, and this is the beauty of computers, which is just really fun to like sometimes be like, I could use this to solve any problem. And then you go through the list and you're like, which problems would people really need to be solved and which ones do people not care about? I do like the idea of, um, you know, what is a deployment? A deployment is like, a, it's got an image in it and we've got some containers and it assumes that something can set up a whole bunch of containers on the same network. And if you've got that, if you've got something underneath it that can do it, maybe not every flag is useful, but like, you know, people have been doing Docker Compose translation to Cube and Cube back mm -hmm. to Docker Compose for a really long time. Um, one of the things like thinking about, you know, the problem though, is like, if you have a Docker image, you can run it anywhere. Okay. Well, like, uh, what does that look like on a system? Most people don't care. They just want to see what the image runs like. So you got to follow some rules, but, um, there's a lot of like declarative style problems that if you can make it really easy to be like, well, you know, I don't need a, and going back to pre Kubernetes, there was a lot of people looking at system D at a large scale, uh, core OS mm -hmm. did fleet. Uh, and it was a system D unit and it got put on individual machines. A lot of those ideas are still useful. Uh, what does a unit look like? Uh, it's just your API. So like a unit file for system D. Um, and so we're kind of, I would say, making it really easy to come up with new APIs that feel declarative, that feel cube-like, that you can stitch together with your existing applications is kind of our short-term goal. Um, I think there's a lot of room for, if you want to declaratively control a whole bunch of machines, like let's say you're at the edge and you have tens of thousands of machines, one of the ideas has been, well, I don't have to use a deployment to create something at the edge. I just want some of those pieces. You know, I might want to say, I want to run, you know, three containers on this really stripped down ARM device that doesn't have Kubernetes on it. Um, but the definition of, I just want to run three containers, uh, something like Podman or Cryo or Container D or Docker could actually go do that at those machines or System D actually. Um, could we have kind of a cube-like definition up here? And then instead of having that go straight to a cube cluster, right? Where the interface is the implementation, have something in between. It's like, well, I can take that definition and turn it into a System D unit file and then put it into maybe my, you know, my special distribute this to thousands of machines, whether it's Ansible or something, that kind of flexibility, um, being able to do that alongside the applications that are gonna to talk to that edge device might actually be useful. And it, sometimes it isn't, right? Two different teams have different life cycles. So we're kind of trying to open the door to uh, not just Cube. Um, and I like to use the example here is like, if you have a Cube app, Sometimes you have 12 factor apps alongside it. Maybe you're still using Heroku. Uh, maybe you're actually using Lambdas. Um, you've got to have, you know, you use two different config systems today or you use Terraform. Um, that combination of config and experience is like, well, wouldn't it be awesome if I could deploy something to Netlify? Like a, I could just sort of deploy my static documentation website to Netlify or my homepage to, to Netlify. And I could use the same tool at the same time to deploy it to um, Kubernetes, but not just one Kubernetes cluster, maybe like three Kubernetes clusters. Or, I could, and then I can connect that service to other cloud services like a database service. Um, and sometimes that database is running on my laptop or running on my cluster. And sometimes it's um, you know, a service like uh, MongoDB Atlas or something like that. You know, The idea that I really just wanted to find my app and I talked to stuff like SQL databases or NoSQL databases. 
I don't really care about the details. Could we make that easier as a loop that you could do together? So you could deploy both, check them both into Git, have a GitOps flow that just applies them to a server. That kind of loop, we're still really early, um, but I'd like to sh we'd like to show those demos and we actually are kind of prototyping towards that in the KCP project. Um, mm -hmm. And we're getting a lot of ideas like this. It's still, this is still super early, but you know, I've heard from others in the community, like this is really interesting. I've been doing something like this. Could we work together? And that's what community is all about. So that's kind of where we are today. So I wanted to pause here for just a second um, and ask uh, Mr. Short, did, uh, did we have any questions? One um, question. Okay. Um, so Clayton, uh, and I think all of us can give an opinion here. Uh, where do you see Kubernetes sitting in the future? Entirely bare metal, or do you also see a space for underlying virtualization and I'm curious what your answer is, Clayton, before I give mine. I feel like uh, all of computing is a yes and kind yeah. of conversation um, where we never get rid of anything. We either reinvent it, we redesign it, or we just keep using it. Um, so I actually think- uh, We're all you know, for the same thing. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and, and you know, the interesting thing is we keep getting better at all of it, right? So why was virtualization invented? Because it really, really sucks to deal with bare metal. Hmm. And, you know, the, the first days of a VM, I, re I, I remember the first mm -hmm. day at work that I fired up a VM and I was like, oh, this is really slow and janky, but I could see how this could be awesome. And it was a little bit like the first time I fired up Docker, right? It, it gave me something new. And then over the years, like virtualization matured, um, you know, but like, it wasn't just virtualization got better. It was Linux changed or the types of apps we wrote for VMs changed, or we developed new tools that made dealing with VMs. So I think it's gonna, I think it's a yes and. I think Kubernetes is really, really well suited to both. But I do think, you know, Kubernetes is increasingly going to be something that people run uh, through services. And those services give you a little bit of flexibility to, to cheat. Um, and by cheat, I mean, maybe it's not the exact Kubernetes code base underneath. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit of what we've been doing in KCP is like, if it looks like a cube server, and it walks like a cube server and it quacks like a cube server, does it matter whether it's uh, version, you know, and, and like this is APIs are really important. If the API works, you don't really care what version it is. I think we're getting to a point where you probably want to not care what infrastructure it runs on. You want it to run well in all of the places. And if the open source community does its job right, um, and that's really all of us just working on our own best interests uh, collaboratively, that idea of, oh, it's a place I can run apps. I don't have to learn 15 different systems. I don't have to uh, glue it all together with duct tape. Um, that interface of deploying apps on Kubernetes, like that can spread pretty far. And I think I'd, we'd like to bring in more things. Um, you know, as I was saying before, like connect out to other services. Like I don't wanna have to make a decision about uh, where my dependencies can run because I'm running on Kubernetes. I just wanna use a dependency. Um, if I need a database, somebody's given me that database. In a dev flow though, I might spin up a really cheap local copy. How do we give that flexibility to do both extremes? That's uh, that's kind of where we're going, I think. That's awesome. And I agree wholeheartedly, right? Like there's room for everything, right? Like, and who knows, there might be something new that comes along and supplants everything else, right? Like it's just well, the nature of tech, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it's usually a new paradigm or something that's, um, that makes the previous thing much easier, but then the old thing is still there. And then a bunch of people build the adaptation between the old thing and the new thing. I mean, even you know, going back to system D, you know, a lot of people, system D changed a lot, but I think Linux is better for it. Um, I certainly um, did not grow up, you know, doing RC in it scripts and, no. you know, sysv in it. And, and every time I had to debug something in an Apache start script where I was like, why am I reinventing starting a Linux process 500 times poorly, because I don't understand Bash as well as people who've been doing it for 20 years. You know, for all of like those flaws is like you come and you take the system, that underlying system is still there, the new system layer is on top and it solves a bunch of problems. I hope that somebody comes up with a super awesome idea and that the Cube ecosystem is flexible enough to be like, oh, we'll just integrate that too, or we'll get integrated too. Like that's, I think what makes, you know, tech awesome is, it's up to us to really adapt to change. Yeah, and and I think 
it's funny because it, it like you say that and I agree with you. Um, but at the same time, it's also one of our biggest challenges a lot of the time um, is it's really difficult for for most software to kind of adapt to change. Um, you know, so I think the ideas that you're kind of talking about with Kubernetes um, make a lot of sense to me and kind of show like and getting back to what I was talking about at the beginning of the show. Um, kind of understanding the ethos behind a tool chain or whatever. Like, I really do think that's one of the things about Kubernetes, right? It's like, you you can't really do anything in Kubernetes without using CRDs, right? It, it even has its own slang, right? Um, custom resource definitions, right? So in other words, Kubernetes is not sufficient to do most of what you want to do, um, kind of in the core of it. But that's the value in my mind, right, is that you do have that flexibility and you can entertain ideas like doing KCP, um, you know, or, or other things like that. So I think that recognizing, um, uh, you know, a, a propensity for change uh, can make you a better, like, and you're, you're trying to become more active in Kubernetes. I think that's a real important message to take away uh, that, you know, Kubernetes is about being able to change. And so you, you make trade-offs to do that. Um, and so actually what I would kind of like to ask is, do you see any of those trade-offs? Where, where does it make it tougher um, that it is so flexible? So I think Kubernetes, um, and I think this is a, a complaint and it's a valid criticism of Kubernetes, which is it's just complex enough to solve 80% of your problems. Um, and yeah let you be able to solve the 20% that it doesn't solve. Um, someone, uh, uh, a Microsoft Word uh, architect made this comment a long time ago. Of, um, they found that everybody uses 20% of the function in Word, but everybody uses a different 20%. I don't think Cube's quite that there, but it's like, it's a complex system because the problem it's trying to solve is you got a bunch of machines. You would need to define something that lets you survive any one of those machines going down and you want it to be stable enough that you can go predict it. The people writing Cube are not perfect and they're not uh, magical. Um, they can't you know, predict exactly how all these things would play out. And so like Cube is a reasonably complex system, um, but it's probably about as simple as it can get to represent the problem it's trying to solve. That next gen though, is what's the simpler ideas that keeps the core um, and 12 factor apps are like a great example. 12 factor apps work until they don't. When they stop working, because you have a problem that's more complex, you have to go build a second system to do it. And I think you know one of Kubernetes' successes is you don't have to have a second system to run the vast majority of software in the world. So you, instead of eighty percent of apps being twelve factor, and you got to go have a different system for the other twenty percent. Um, I think Cube moved that that ratio, which is Cube can run ninety seven percent of applications, and you can with some effort make the other three percent work or tie them in. Mm -hmm. uh, what we have to be open to though is what makes it more complicated. What are the layers on top that make it easy? And the answer is, is nobody, you know, there's teams that uh, do self-service on top of Kubernetes and there's, um, and that worked for a long time. Um, but then as people got more and more clusters, self-service doesn't work. And so that's like another angle with like KCP, which is most teams, most individuals in an organization are looking for something to help them self-service their development journey that's flexible enough that they're happy. And when the infrastructure teams need to put these rules in because they're afraid of security breaches that cost the company hundreds of millions of dollars or expose customer info or result in like if you're a hospital and you, you know hospital applications are a little, a little uh, more uh, formalized, but there's like big complex masses of software that run our lives. Uh, you gotta have some responsibility there. That balance between a development team YOLOing it huh. and an infrastructure team saying you can't do anything is where all of us who make software for a living eventually sit, whether it's in, whether you know it or not. And so I think one of the things like maybe not Kubernetes sits as an infrastructure piece. I think the problem we're all trying to solve is how do we get, how do we let people accomplish most of the things they want to accomplish easier without thinking about it. That was the goal of Kubernetes. That's been the goal of platform as a service. That's what everybody is building in their large companies. They just, you know, they, they cobble it together or they, they put a bit of time. I want to really focus that ecosystem of people who want to make self-service and control that 
the developers doing anything they want and the, pro, and the operations teams or the security teams or the SRE teams or the uh, CISO whose job is on the line if, if we get it wrong, we want to we want to tighten that and have like a really tight loop between those two teams. And everybody builds their own approaches today. I think that's the real opportunity. It's not about cloud. It's not about on-premise. It's not about edge. You're building an app and it's got to run someplace. How do you get that interface right between the teams? And I think that's what Kubernetes is a, um, a first stage of. And there's plenty of other projects that are going to be completely unrelated to Cube, like Terraform does this great. Ansible does this great. Uh, Git, uh, GitHub through their you know source Excellent. code actions yeah, as actions. a part of this story. Mm -hmm. How do we like keep iterating in the open source world so that you have this nice layer that you can rely on everywhere and you have the flexibility above it to do whatever you want and those work well together. That's what I get to do every day and it's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the things um, I actually kind of regularly use as an example is like, you know, uh, software, you know, has is ridiculously young compared to most of the other kind of human exercises, right? Like, you know, we've been doing medicine for several thousand years, right? Um, you know, whereas computer science, you know, even you know, even in academia, right, is I don't know, it's put, you know, arguably in the nearing maybe 80 years old or something, maybe 100, um, you know, but that is a ridiculously short amount of time. Uh, and it's evolving at a ridiculous pace, right? Um, and so I, I regularly talk about it. it's funny because we're still trying to solve that same problem of when I, you know, was first starting new development, you know, I would yell down the hall to the guy who was running the, the server room and be like, okay, what version of PHP can I use? Right. Because because that guy is the one who's going to have to operate it. Right. And so um, I would never build anything without knowing that I can actually put it into production. And I think in some ways we're trying to not formalize, but we're trying to make that communication scale because now it's not just me and the one guy down the hall with one server right we're talking global we're talking you know thousand person development teams we're talking thousand person sre teams plus sysadmins plus you know a database admin you know like all these people involved now so we're trying to articulate that same conversation in a way that is flexible enough that we can you know actually have all of the conversations well, and not just flexible enough, but explainable, right? Like we talk right. about an AI explainable. Um, there's so much power available in modern infrastructure, whether it's a cloud service or what you can do locally is that one person can spend $10 million. You know, as a, someone made a joke the other day, I, I thought it was awesome, which is um, one person can spend $10 million in a day if they have uh, the right controls or the right quotas on a cloud. Mm. That power, you know, that connection between like I've used a service, I can get it up and running and open source does the same thing every day, which is, you know, every time you bring up a instance of a Rust app or a PHP app or a Perl app um, or Java, you're bringing up millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of investment and, you know, years of people's lives and you don't even think about it the folks who have to think about it every day is like, okay, like how do we keep your supply chain going? How do we keep people from spending all of your money? Um, how do we, how do we know what you're spending the money on? And what if you have hundreds of people in different places spending, you know, building stuff, you don't want to stop them from building stuff because the goal for most organizations, most engineers, most teams is I just want to get this one thing going. And then I want it to keep working forever, even though we would say like, oh, of course we're going to do tests and CI and uh, we'll have a you know, rigorous release cycle. And yeah. the reality is, is it's like 99% of it is like, oh, it's working. Don't touch it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And, so and trying, to like, trying to find that balance. Like, uh, yeah, it's that we're doing it at scale. We're increasingly, we're not, we don't need to think about the infrastructure. Um, how do we build those kind of layers of, of interface, which is like, yep, I'm building my app. I'm done. Somebody else can use that interface productively. And I think we're kind of, I mean, we were like bracketing down, right? We had 12 factor, um, you know, Paz was a little too, um, a little too, uh, too far up. Yeah. Too far up the stack. Um, and we had virtualization and Kubernetes and, you know, different types of things that integrate with Terraform. Like you can do amazing things with Terraform and Ansible, like, you know, deploy a huge fleets. Um, I got to admit some days I'm like, I don't really want to because each of those little bits are designed by an individual 
they take somebody else's API and they make their own API on top of it. I'm not depending on the cloud provider not to change their API. I'm depending on the open source volunteer who out of their time built the interface between you know, uh, this representation of an API provided by a cloud provider. Uh, it's gotta support that thing. So it's a new API. So we got all these APIs and then we have all these you know, these high level things, can we bring that layer so there's a nice, you know, thin, um, you know, I can just say like, here's 99.99% of all apps that you'll ever need to build, go run them on whatever infrastructure. I'm not gonna think about it anymore. Um, and we're getting close. I mean, I, I don't, you know, in the next like five, 10 years, I mean, a lot of, we've learned a lot. Like when I started, we were talking about infrastructure as code or sorry, mm -hmm. when I started, we we're talking about infrastructure as API or API driven infrastructure. Nobody talks about that now. They talk about declarative config or declarative infrastructure or infrastructure as code. Um, we take it for granted. I think another 10 years, we're, we're much further down that scale of, there's probably a standardized way to deploy every application you ever need. Someone adds a new one. You don't have to change your tooling. You just add a new API. Right. And right. that's, I think, where I want KCP and Cube and the things that, you know, that we work on to, how do we help people bridge that layer? So uh, weirdly enough, uh, so first up, I have to I have to throw out there that I was uh, really really hoping for a Brewster's Millions reference in there. Um, and uh, if you haven't if you haven't seen that movie, uh, I'm dating myself, and you should go watch it. But uh, the one of the things that you know kind of is the good and bad thing, but like I find it kind of amazing these days that you can manage to share your Amazon API key on the internet. Right. Because your your deployment tool chain, all that other stuff is so, um, you know, codified. Right. You can write code that does it that you can actually just drop your key in there and publish it by accident because you can just automate the whole thing. So cautionary terror. Don't do that. Um, but on the flip side, I think it's really impressive that we've come so far along that. Uh, I don't reference it on a piece of paper anymore, right? I just embed it somewhere and magic happens, um, you know? And it really, it, it feels, especially to anybody who's ever had to swap a hard drive in a server, uh, it really does feel like magic these days. Um, I think it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, on that note, uh, unless Chris, if there was any other questions you wanted to cover, I think- um, No, there's pretty quiet like chat to, this morning. Yeah, um, you know, uh, even though I did tweet about the fact that it's a little later in the day, uh, it is a Tuesday, so maybe that's why people aren't as. No, I mean, there's there's people watching. There's like, oh yeah, there's yeah, some people watching, but yeah. Well, I mean, it's Tuesday before the Fourth of July. So oh, that's I don't know about too. the rest of you, but oh. I'm already on vacation this week, right? right and yeah. uh, I'm just hoping that no fires erupt, right. uh, that nobody finds a horrific bug in Kubernetes. <laughs> that suddenly yeah. I'm going to get work like this is the mm. please let's just get to fourth of the july right, weekend right. and have a nice long weekend i will say one of the things that i really appreciate about red hat uh and i think it's starting to become much more industry standard is people don't do deployments on fridays as much anymore um you know or or getting on, getting way less people. um if you've yeah, got by, good monitoring you should be fine oh yeah yeah everything's yeah. perfect um you know that's actually a good question so i'll, I'll be this factoid uh, to you, Chris, is I'll go look up and see when people do their OpenShift upgrades and we'll see whether <laughs> people actually don't do their OpenShift and Kubernetes upgrades on Friday or not. Uh, yeah, and, uh, that would be I'll good. give that back to you. Man. Right. We should uh, we should at the beginning of the, of the show, uh, you know, what it's going to be every month, we can just actually pause for a second and tell people this is a good time to do your OpenShift upgrade. You watch the show <laughs> and it'll be done when the show's that's over right. thereabouts. Yeah, uh, that's right. There you go. Uh, we could segue. It'll be like getting a cup of coffee, except even better. Uh, there so. You go. Uh, so Clayton, thanks so much for coming. We really appreciate uh, you uh, putting up with a little bit of, uh, you know, noisiness uh, with our, our first uh, kind of uh, production episode. Um, you know, do keep in mind, we did do a behind the scenes kind of why are we doing this show uh, episode with uh, a couple of people who are more in the background. Uh, and, uh, you know, you should go watch that on Kubernetes by example. Uh, I think we put in the link earlier. Um, I got it. Drop it again. Um, and then obviously, if you weren't able to catch this whole show, it will be on the YouTubes, um, you know, in perpetuity, or at least as long as Google's around. Uh, so, you know, please uh, go check it out there. 
we'll be back again. Our cadence is going to be the last Tuesday of the month. Uh, so we will see you again. Anybody can do quick uh, monthly math. Let's see. Uh, blah. Quick July. Uh, what's that? 27th? 27? 27? Sorry, July yeah. 27. Uh, so we'll be back. Uh, and between now and then, we will announce who our next guest will be. Um, and it will be another insider from inside mm -hmm. the Kubernetes world. Um, but again, thanks so much for coming. Thank you uh, to the audience uh, for showing up. Um, and we had a couple questions. We appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you next time. Yeah, take it easy out there, folks. Stay safe. <laughs>